Spain in a different location? Different location, yes. That will really get us going, won't it? Well, we're in the sanctuary tonight, and we're going to be trying this for the next couple of weeks. Okay, okay. Just something different. Um, this beautiful setting here in the sanctuary. Awesome. Okay. Let's give it a shot. So, as always, we are so glad that you're here tonight, and we're going to start out with our opening song, We Are All Welcome. some slides in church last Sunday, but this will be a little more extensive part. It's going to be after worship, and we're going to meet in the uh, uh, fire cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and people can go get their treats first and all that, then come on down there, and we're going to do a little presentation, a little more extended presentation of my trip. A lot of people have been asking, and I just wanted to uh, bring this fact up a little bit, kids, that uh, this is a picture of Sadek when he was going to school, okay, um, and they wear uniforms, and this is right outside the apartment, and, and just I want people to realize that this is kind of an ongoing ministry. Okay, just because I was there and we got it set up, um, Cedric has two more years of school left, okay, that will be helping the boys at least for two years yet, and uh, Terry goes out and does his thing when he can, you know, he does uh, physical labor work, so to say, okay, to make ends meet, but again, this will be a two-year project yet that we'll be helping the boys out, okay, we have the God of Mission Fund set up here at church, if people want to give to it, then we get a credit for you all. Okay, good. And a service opportunity, uh, we need six more people next week, Thursday. In fact, I think, again, they'll take up to eight now. But uh, next week, Thursday, 10 o'clock, um, just show up. It's door number 17. We were there this morning. We had a great group of people. Okay, we had Terry there and Sandy and Pat and myself. And first we had to sort seeds because they give seeds away for people to do gardens. We did that. And then we had to do noodles, okay? And you can kind of see that big bin behind Terry right there, Jim. Okay? Yeah. There was 1,300, 1,300 pounds of noodles in that bin when we started. Can you see any noodles at all, Jim, in the top of that bin? No. Just so you know how we work. 1,300 pounds, Jim. That's okay? pretty efficient. It, it was, it was. And uh, we got the noodles bagged up in the bags. And again, I always say, uh, the feed my people, people are always very, very appreciative of the whole church because we're there every Thursday. You know, we're very consistent. We have a great group. We always have room for more, though. Okay, it's a great little family, but come and join us on Thursday. Okay, and then Jimmy, Jimmy, we got a big party on Sunday. It's not that a far big away. Party on Sunday, yeah. Mr. Gary, okay, he's retiring. Okay, we're having a big wing day right after church on Sunday. Okay, with food and all kinds of goodies and all that. And okay, we're having left some. We're having left some. Okay, here was Jane slaving away in her kitchen. Okay, making the fresh left some. Okay, and it just came to mind. Okay, I got that's what it looks like when it's done. Okay, now. Yeah. Now, I'm a Hollerman, 
okay? So when I came here, I didn't know about this lepsis thing at all. No. What you do with it? I thought you'd take a piece of that and, you know, put a piece of boiled ham on it and eat like a sandwich, okay? You know, but I found out, no, that's not the way you do it, okay? So no. they say you put some butter on it yes. and some sugar and then you roll it up, right? Lots and of butter. Lots of butter, okay, okay. So we're going to have that already on Sunday. And then I also heard that people put meatballs. That's right, they put meatballs on that. Lepsibus. I'm pretty good at that, huh? Because yeah. Hollander can see that pretty good, huh? Lepsibus. So we're going to have that on Sunday. There'll be lots of lefts and lots of good food over at Fellowship Hall, okay? And then next week, next week Thursday, Jimmy, we're going to be talking about the loss, but not the east. I love the time. Okay, have you ever lost, Jimmy? Oh, yeah, all the time. All the time. And we're all lost in some way, and we're going to talk about being lost sometimes in our spiritual life when Jesus comes and sucks us back in. Okay, lost but not the east next week, okay? But tonight, tonight we're going to be talking about the lessons of the fig tree. We're going to be studying the fig tree tonight. You know, many times through the Old Testament, a uh, fruitful tree was often used as kind of a spiritual symbol of a godly living, okay? And Jesus pointed out that what happened to the other kind of trees, you know, sometimes they always don't bear fruit, okay? And it takes valuable time away, you know, from the gardener when you have a tree that really doesn't produce fruit. So by the illustration of the fig tree, Jesus warns us that, you know, God will not tolerate that our lack of productivity. God gives us these gifts and he wants to use them, you know, in our spiritual life and our everyday life. So Jesus is asking us, you know, have you been enjoying God's special treatment but not giving anything in return? So today we're going to find out what we can do to respond to the gardener's patient care and that we should also start to begin to bear fruit. God created us to produce. So as always, Jimmy and I ask you to sit back let the Holy Spirit enter your hearts and minds, and we're going to worship our God, and we're going to study the lessons of the fig tree. So tonight, we're going to start our service with a unison prayer. We'll say it again. You create us for profound love, O God. You have given us depth of feeling to share it with others. You make us spiritually hungry to search for you within ourselves and in those whose lives touch ours. Yet we seek to numb our feelings and feed our hunger with junk. We turn on our televisions to tune out the world around us. We shop for what we think will satisfy our longing for beauty or goodness. We eat without considering the worth or value of our food. We do any number of mindless tasks without noticing or searching for your presence in our lives. Forgive us, O oh God. Touch us again in our deep places, the wells of hunger that only you can fill. Fashion us again to be your vibrant people, alive for you in all we say, feel, and do. Amen. We'd, start, we'd like to start out tonight with a song called, Come into His Presence with Thanksgiving in Our Hearts.
scripture lesson comes from Luke chapter 13, it's verses 1 through 9. And our scripture lesson tonight really contains two stories. The first five verses is Jesus telling us to repent because we're all mortal and we're going to die someday. And verses 6 through 9 tell the story of the barren fig tree. And that's where the message will come from this evening. So I will be reading the scripture lesson tonight. About that time, some people came up and told him about the Galileans Pilate had killed while they were at worship, mixing their blood with the blood of the sacrifices on the altar. Jesus responded, Do you think those murdered Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Not at all. Unless you turn to God, you too will die. And those 18 in Jerusalem the other day, the ones crushed and killed when the Tower of Siloam collapsed and fell on them, do you think they were worse citizens than all other Jerusalemites? Not at all. Unless you turn to God, you too will die. Then he told them a story. A man had an apple tree planted in his front yard. He came to it expecting to find apples, but there weren't any. He said to his gardener, what's going on here? For three years now, I've come to this tree expecting apples and not found one apple I have found. Chop it down. Why waste wood ground with it any longer? The gardener said, let's give it another year. I'll dig around it and fertilize, and maybe it will produce next year. If it doesn't, then chop it down. Here ends the reading tonight from the Message Bible. You know, have you ever bought something and then it didn't work? You know, you spend good, hard-earned money on something and you bring it home and spending time hooking it up or putting it together and it doesn't work. How does it make you feel? Are you angry, hurt, sad, or maybe some other feeling? What if the store would not take it back so you couldn't return it? A couple weeks ago, my daughter Sherry bought a new ink pack or her picture printer. And she was out of town and she stopped at a staple store. Staples is like office max. And she didn't have the exact number of her ink pack, but the clerk gave her ink pack and told her it would fit. But when she got home, which was quite a ways away in Minnesota, Sherry found out that the ink pack didn't work. But you're worse yet, she had thrown the receipt away and she tore open the box to get the ink pack out. Now she had a $30 ink pack and it didn't work. Have you ever wondered that Jesus may feel the same way when we refuse to work for him? In our scripture tonight, we find a vineyard owner who is expecting inspecting his vineyard. He comes across the tree, and it didn't put any fruit bearing in the last several years. And he asked the gardener why it's taking up space if it's not producing fruit. One time there was a farmer who planted two fruit trees on opposite sides of the property. One he planted to provide a hedge to hide the unsightly view of an old landfill. The other to provide shade for, and rest for under Blue Mountain Stream, which ran beside his fields. And as the two trees grew, both produced and began to flower and bear fruit. But well, one day the farmer decided to gather some of the fruit to the tree nearest to his house the one that was used to be a hedge against the landfill. Well, as he brought the fruit inside the house, he noticed, you know, it was a little deformed. The unevenness of the fruit, you know, wasn't very good. But the fruit still looked, you know, very edible. Well, later that evening, while sitting on his porch, the farmer took one of the pieces of fruit for a snack. And by the end of the fruit, he found it really bitter, completely inedible. Casting the fruit aside, he looked across the field to the other tree by the mountain stream. After walking across the field, the farmer took a piece of fruit from the other tree and he bit into it. That fruit was delicious and very sweet. And he gathered several more pieces and took them home. You see, the fruit was greatly affected by the nutrition of the root. Just as the tree that grew by the landfill had to be bitter, the tree by the stream produced sweet fruit. So the Christian, we have a choice. We can either put down our roots into the soil of the landfill of earthly pursuits, or into the cool, refreshing stream of the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We must understand that the roots bear the fruit. 
The fruit of the Christian is the outward evidence of the inward motivation. Let me water them and fertilize them with the word. Maybe they will produce fruit next year. In the backyard, there once lived an apple tree and a thorn bush. Well, the apple tree produced nice, juicy apples that everyone liked eating. Kids would climb up the tree and pluck the apples. Worms would eat the ones that fell on the ground. Birds would peck at the fruit on the tree. The owner would prune and spray the tree to make sure that it produced lots of fruit for the neighborhood. In the other corner, about 50 yards from the apple tree, there was a thorn bush. No one messed with the thorn bush. No one picked any fruit off of it. Everyone left it alone. At first, the apple tree liked all the attention. But after about 10 years, it started becoming envious of the thorn bush. It said to the thorn bush, you know, I'm sick of everyone climbing on me and picking my fruit. The master's always trimming me, putting me uh, special attention, having smelly manure around my trunk, always making you know, such a big fuss over me. And not just one time, but all the time, all throughout the whole year. To be truthful, a Christian help cannot help produce fruit on its own. There's a need, there's a drive in us that wants to reproduce. We want to lead more people to Christ. We want to serve our master. There's two types of Christians. Ones that are producing fruit, yeah, they have those that aren't. The fruit tree is barren. It's not producing fruit. It's just standing there in the middle of the vineyard doing nothing but taking up space. It's not contributing anything. Then comes the owner and says, why is it still there? Why hasn't it been dug up and thrown away? And the vineyard man says, wait, wait, give it another year to work the roots, fertilize it. Let me see if I can get it to bear fruit. See, Jesus is the gardener. He's pleading for us. He's saying, let me work with them just a little more. Let me help them to bear fruit. I wish they'd go somewhere else. But better yet, let Jesus work with us. Let Jesus be our master. You know, some people don't appreciate us bearing fruit. Some people, when you bear fruit, they take advantage of you. There's some people that don't like us at all. But in the end, knowing that you have the peace of mind that you're doing good stuff for Jesus, that you're bearing fruit, that's what God wants out of us. And then we have the pleasure knowing that God will take care of us. We know that God is using us for good. So forget about what you can understand and what you can feel. You're just going to have a great peace of mind that God loves you. And he's using you for his purpose. So why are we not bearing fruit? What keeps us from adding to the video? We are bearing fruit in our lives because we're not serving Jesus. We have better things to do than waste our time and telling people about Jesus or helping out at church or fulfilling a mission. Sometimes we feel, ah, my job's more important. I got my house, I got my family. I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to reach out to see what Jesus wants me to do. I mean, come on, I have a life. I can't be wasted at being one of these holy good doers. I mean, you know, he doesn't need me to serve him. He has all those preachers and missionaries, Sunday school teachers, those Jesus freaks. They're hung up on every word that Jesus says. I can't be like that. I'm going to do what I want to do. That Bible stuff, it's outdated. It's out of touch with reality. Who ever heard of talking to God anyway? I'll come to church on Sunday morning, but I'm not going to come for that Bible study or sure not listen to that encounter of hope service. Sunday morning is all the religion I need. Let others do it if they want to do it, but I'm going to do what I want to do because my life is too short. Are you listening tonight and say, no, no, I don't say that. You know, you probably don't in those words. But the truth is that what you're saying when you choose not to serve the Lord are exactly those words. You know, sometimes we get angry when the pastor preaches on something that hits close to home. And then we use an excuse for not coming to church. We say, yeah, everybody's a hypocrite at that church. 
We can't come. We gotta get ready for work on Monday. Excuse after excuse, but the bottom line is that we're not serving because we don't want to serve. What was the response of the owner of the vineyard? Why has this bear tree not been removed? He wanted to cut it down because it wasn't producing. You see, Jesus bought you with his blood. He paid a price for us in that cross. He planted us in the garden and now he tends to us. He watches as is waiting for us to produce fruit. S.D. Gordon tells of a spring storm that broke a large limb on his cherry tree. And although it was hung by a very slender strand, his, his surprise, blossoms came anyway. And later some fruit began to grow as it did on all the other branches. He noticed, however, that only those in full contact with the tree wore much fruit. Why the severe branch produced only a scanty supply. You know, as believers, we must be careful about our spiritual connections, making sure we are abiding with Christ. The fruit we bear, whether much or little, it tells a story about us. If we are producing fruit, we're assured of our salvation. Jesus gives us many opportunities to serve and to come to Him. Sometimes we got to look just past our pride. A Christian has fruit. Maybe you once produced fruit, but no longer you're producing fruit. Maybe the world has gotten in the way. Maybe you're just tired. Sometimes we feel, you know, we've done our part. We're done. You can never retire from Jesus' work because it goes on for eternity. Maybe you have walked away from Jesus. You have quit thinking about him during the day. And once he was all that you thought about. Maybe the temptations around us have snared us. Jesus says, let my work be with you, and I will be with you in my work. Jesus wants you to bear fruit. He wants you to grow and thrive. He wants you to work. He's waiting to always give us another opportunity. He doesn't want to cut us down. He desires we serve him. Jesus is asking to serve him this morning, this evening, this week, this month. And if we look for it, Jesus will surely give us the opportunity to serve. And this, my good friends, is truly the word of the Lord for today.
God have any patience with you about bearing fruit? God will put many opportunities before us this coming week to serve him and to bear fruit. Jesus does not want to cut us down. Jesus wants us to serve him this day, this month, forever. Go now, Jesus is our master gardener, fertilizing and watering our souls so that we may produce fruit and go in peace.